Hello there, I'm Sebastian, and I'm happy to be presenting our work on how applications can work together uh, with operating systems to achieve good performance in disaggregated data centers. And this is a collaboration with me here and with Sid. So what exactly is disaggregation? Well, if you look at existing data center racks today, they consist of a bunch of server blades, and each of these servers looks something like this. It has a motherboard, which includes the CPU, memory, storage, GPU, and nowadays also a fast network card. And all of these resources are gonna be co-located on the same board. In contrast, in disaggregated systems, some of these resources are gonna be taken out, in other words, disaggregated, and are gonna be uh, accessed via a fast network. So for example, nowadays it is fairly common to see storage be disaggregated. Uh, in such cases, the servers can access the, the storage through the network. And the same is true of GPUs and tensor processing units. In this work, however, we are interested in a more radical design in which the memory is also disaggregated. So in such disaggregated data centers or DDCs, we have servers that are gonna have a bunch of processing uh, power, so processors and some local memory. However, uh, the bulk of the memory is gonna sit off chip on a different blade that's gonna be accessible uh, through the network. And the local memory is going to serve two roles. First is going to store the operating system because we still need someone to actually manage uh, the service resources. And second is going to serve as a cache for application state. So even though the stack, the heap, the program code, all of that is gonna live off chip in the big memory blade, some of it is gonna be cached locally. At this point, you might be wondering, wait, why are we separating the CPU from the memory? Isn't that the opposite of the whole, you know, let's move compute closer to the data trend that we've had for, for many years now? And the answer is yes, but DDCs actually bring with them many operational benefits. For example, they provide independence. So if a new memory technology happens to come out, the operator can just replace the memory blades without having to touch, for example, the motherboards of the CPU servers or the accelerators or the storage uh, nodes. Furthermore, you can also scale resources independently. If you happen to need more, more memory, just add more memory blades or, or add more, more memory chips to a memory blade. And failures can uh, also happen separately. There are situations in which a memory node can fail, but the CPU node might still be okay. Or, or vice versa. The second reason uh, that DDCs help is that they make provisioning easier. For example, if a customer uh, comes to you and they ask you for some unusual hardware configuration, like three CPUs and 117 gigabytes of RAM and, and two GPUs, um, this is actually easy to do with DDCs, but it's pretty tricky to do in today's data center. Because today, what we would probably do is give the customer uh, a big server that has a bunch of CPUs, a bunch of RAM, and a bunch of GPUs. So DDCs can help uh, data center operators be less wasteful. So at this point, it is clear that there are many benefits for operators, uh, but can we actually run existing applications on these data centers? And the answer is yes. Uh, there's this super cool operating system called Lego OS that basically runs on these disaggregated data centers and it essentially presents a standard POSIX interface uh, to applications so they can run uh, without any modifications and without having any idea that they're running on this wacky infrastructure. Uh, however, I think the question that we should be asking uh, in, th in this area is not can we run applications but should we run unmodified applications on DDCs? And this is where things are a little bit less nice. Um, so recent measurement studies, for example, our recent work at VLDB this year, shows that running uh, unmodified production applications on disaggregated data centers actually results in over one order of magnitude performance degradation. And one reason for this degradation is that even though we have a local memory cache, many of the loads and stores end up going to the remote memory anyway. So to demonstrate this, consider the following example. So we have two applications, app one and app two, and they're gonna be running on two different servers. And what they want is for, uh, is app one wants to send some data to, to app two. 
And to accomplish this, uh, App One needs to do a couple of things. So first, it needs to load the data from its remote memory to its local memory. And here, we're assuming that the data is not already cached. And then it needs to send the data uh, over the network to the other application. And finally, the other application might actually need to store the data on its remote memory if either the data happens to be too big for the local cache or maybe the application is not yet ready to use the data. So we ended up with a bunch of data movement. And the sad thing about this example is that the data ends up in the same place anyway. So our position in this work is that applications should be modified to run on this non-traditional hardware. And to do that, we need to make sure that the operating system exposes enough information and functionality so that these applications can actually exploit it. And in the rest of this talk, I will discuss what abstractions DDC operating systems should expose to applications. And then I'm gonna give you a couple of examples of applications that can actually benefit from these abstractions. So let me just start with what information OSs can expose to applications. So first, uh, OSs could expose which servers are accessing the same memory nodes. Second, OSs could expose to applications when a memory node has crashed or is unreachable. And this can be useful for applications that implement their own fault tolerant protocols. And I'll discuss this um, later in the talk. And finally, since memory nodes run independently on their own blade, they may, um, they may have a CPU or maybe an FPGA, which we could use uh, for offloading computation so that it runs closer to the data. In this talk, however, I'm going to focus on the first two mostly because I feel that the third uh, aspect, which is this computation of loading, uh, is pretty well studied in many other contexts. So our proposal is going to consist of three operating system abstractions. And these are not meant to be exhaustive, just some abstractions that we thought uh, might be useful. The first one we call uh, a memory grant, which is essentially a way for one process to move data to another process more cheaply. So recall our prior example where uh, app one wanted to send data to app two and um, this ended up resulting in a bunch of data movement. So I have that example here on the left. And with a memory grant, which I'm gonna depict here on the right, what app one could do instead is it could just yield control over some of its memory pages to app two. And essentially what this does is it tells the memory node to reconfigure the page permissions so that app two can now access those pages. And then this memory node will then notify the operating system of the server that's running app two um, so that it knows that new pages are available. And then it can just signal the application to, to let it know that the pages are, are available. And the result of this is that we have much fewer uh, data movement. And also another thing to notice is that these messages are small controlled messages as opposed to uh, the big data that the application uh, could be sending in, on, on, here on the left side. So a couple of things about grants. Um, they have move semantics. So if you've ever used Rust, the, the programming language, they feel something like, some, something like that. Uh, it basically means that the grantor, in our case, uh, the application one, <coughs> promises to never access the granted pages ever again. And we need this because uh, otherwise we would have to deal with cache coherence protocols operating across the network, which is going to be a nightmare. Um, there are actually a bunch of challenges with implementing grants. Uh, so one of them is that memory pages may contain data structures that have references to addresses within the page, but also to other pages that might be granted. So it's gonna be important to preserve the correctness of those references. Uh, and in the paper, we discuss a couple of ways to do this. Uh, one of them is to have a global namespace for, for virtual addresses so that we can guarantee that the addresses can stay the same when they are uh, essentially attached to, to the recipient process. So when, the, when app two gets these memory addresses, uh, we can guarantee that it's not already using those addresses. The second abstraction is a memory steal. 
Um, so steals are very similar to a grant, but it is actually performed by the recipient instead of the sender. So for example, app two can request to steal pages from app one, and then the memory node will essentially you know, do the uh, permission changes, and then it will notify app one that those pages are now gone. So this is a little bit tricky and weird because essentially, you know, app one can be doing its thing and then suddenly half of its memory is gone. And so this is gonna introduce some challenges on how do we implement applications that are okay with this type of um, operation. Um, and one of the, one of the things that uh, we identify is that it's very important that the memory that is stolen is internally consistent. Um, as otherwise the process that's stealing that memory, as, so for example, app two, um, might crash. So if I get uh, sort of a snapshot of memory that's not internally consistent, I, I, I will be in trouble. In the paper, we actually discuss how this turns out to be very similar to ensuring crash consistency guarantees in non-volatile memory systems. Uh, so we can use many, many of those techniques such as using transactions and so on. Uh, I'm going to uh, point out though that steals are meant to be used by processes from the same application. Uh, so we, we are not envisioning steals as being used by different competing applications that have nothing to do with each other, but rather uh, you can think of uh, applications coordinating with each other. Um, so you can, you can view an incorrect steal as similar to a bug in a multi-threaded program where one thread stomps on the address space of another thread. Um, so the last abstraction that we propose uh, are failure informers or spice. For example, suppose that app one is performing some load operation and suddenly the memory node crashes. So at this point, app one is in trouble, right? So what it can do, however, is it can actually inform other processes or other applications that its memory has failed and that is soon going to crash. And what we think is that this information uh, can actually help other applications um, figure out what to do in, in this situation. So we think this is useful in, in some cases. And I'm gonna describe some applications uh, in a few slides. So now that we have covered a few different primitives, let me talk about some applications that can actually use these primitives to improve their performance. So the first set of applications that, that we're considering are data flow or graph processing systems like let's say MapReduce or Naiad. Um, and these applications can actually use grants to pass data around from one worker to the next without actually having to send the data over the network. So it's basically like passing data uh, using references instead of by value, uh, if you want to think of it that way. Uh, these applications can also use steel so that uh, one worker can take over the unfinished task of another potentially slow worker. So if there's a worker that hasn't made much progress, you can imagine a new worker being spawned and then that new worker basically stealing the memory of the slow worker. And under the assumption that the memory node is not the bottleneck or, or the, the element that's slow, then this can improve performance and, and deal with stragglers. Also, if you have a scale out system, like for example, memcached, um, what you can do is if there, there are some objects in the object space that are very hot, you can spawn a new uh, memcached instance and then that instance can steal uh, or take ownership over some of the hot parts of the object space. Right? And again, this is especially useful if the bottleneck happens to be computation as opposed to sort of the memory bandwidth. Uh, finally, if we have a system like Paxos, um, Paxos can actually use Spice to recover from failures more quickly. And you know, this has been studied in, in many works before, but in, in this particular context, we have a situation where if the memory dies, if the memory node dies, then the replica uh, could tell others, hey, you know, my memory node died, which means I'm about to die, so please count me out. And this is going to allow other Paxos replicas to go through reconfiguration, uh, which is to say to bring in a new replica and help it catch, uh, catch up to speed much 
more quickly than waiting for an end-to-end -end timeout before spawning a new replica. Also in Paxos, if a CPU dies, there might be situations where uh, Paxos could learn that the CPU died, but that the memory is still okay. And it could spawn a new replica and then steal the old replica's memory to catch up even more quickly than having to download an entire snapshot from another, from another replica. So in summary, um, I guess we're advising against running unmodified applications on DDCs. Um, however, we think that with some modifications, there is potential to make these applications uh, fairly competitive in this environment. And towards this goal, we propose that operating systems expose more information and more control to applications and our abstractions, including uh, Grant, Steel, and Spy, uh, can, can help us push in, in that direction. And with this, um, I conclude my talk and I'm happy to take any questions during the online, online Q&A. Thank you.